PD because I smoked. So I have to pace myself. My Happening now. And although Tropical Storm Beta is a very weak system right now, it's still throwing some rain on shore and we have some areas of rain to talk about. We'll get to that and go live to Justin Horn with the very latest along the Texas coast coming right up. One week from her death, President Trump plans to announce Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's replacement. Why some are against putting the nomination on the fast track. Two women battling it out for the soon to be vacant precinct three commissioner's court seat. We talked to Democratic candidate Christine Hartick about what is the biggest issue that concerns voters. As if delivering a premature baby isn't stressful enough, it's even harder during a pandemic. I'm Courtney Friedman. Coming up, a brave mother shares her story and I'll update you on local hospital regulations. Payment apps are super convenient, but user beware. Coming up, we'll tell you about a scam that can drain your account in seconds. The news at five starts right now. At first at five, we are continuing to track tropical storm beta as it approaches the Gulf Coast. And while the storm's not expected to strengthen into a hurricane, gusty winds, heavy rains expected to arrive in the middle and upper Texas coast. As a precaution today, Governor Greg Abbott issued disaster declarations for 29 counties, and they include Bear County. We have Adam Kasky on standby. We're going to be checking in with him for what we can expect here at home. But first, let's head over to Matagorda, where we found Kesat 12's meteorologist Justin Horn and photojournalist Bill Caldera. All right, Justin, we know Beta isn't going to do massive damage, but it does still pose some danger. What are you seeing? Obviously, you're getting soaked out there. Yeah, we got a pretty good squall coming through right now, guys. That storm is about uh, 25 miles off the coast, and it's getting a little bit closer to us. It'll be making landfall here pretty soon. And I can tell you, yeah, the rain is heavy, but it really has not been the rain or the wind that's been the problem. It's been some of the storm surge. And I want to show you, and Bill can show you, this house here behind us. That water has been creeping up on this house, and they did take on some damage here with the flooding. Uh, they say their first story there took on some water, and uh, they've been dealing with that today. Now, the water's actually down from where it was earlier, believe it or not, but there still could be some storm surge as this uh, system moves onshore. Uh, take a listen to what these homeowners had to say. With a lot of water, obviously, um, our house flooded probably about five inches downstairs. Um, all the debris come in over throughout the day, and uh, it's a mess. So, so the good news here is that most of the damage that we've seen around here is, is minimal. So it, again, it's basically just been this water rise from the storm surge. It's been up to about four feet in some cases, and. It, that has caused some issues, but uh, the folks that live around here are prepared for this sort of thing. They've dealt with it before here in Matagorda, and it looks like the rain's going to continue for a while longer as this thing sort of lingers along the coast. And as we speak, the rain is letting up a little bit here where we are on the Texas coast. But we'll continue to bring you some live updates coming up again here at uh, 6 o'clock. Back to you guys. And here's our live cam looking over the Alamo City. We couldn't even see downtown just a few hours ago because of some rain. Now you can actually see the outline of the building. So let's take a look at the radar. And I want to point out this is exactly where Justin is along this beach access road from the city of Matagorda that leads you to the actual Gulf coastline there with the bays flanking it. And that's that heavy squall that's moving through his area. You can see the center of circulation with this storm. It's just offshore. It's about 25, 30 miles away from Justin's location, and it's thrown some showers our way. We have some areas of light to moderate rain, even some heavier showers. Basically, Castle Hills area down near Crossroads. That's where we have some more modest rain showers, if you will. And this activity is gradually moving westward, even on the southwest side of town. All right, let's take a look at the latest on Tropical Storm Beta. Very weak system. Max winds of about 45 miles per hour. A small area near the center. Could have some gusts up to 60 and it's moving to the northwest at five miles per hour. It's just crawling to the northwest, likely to make landfall later on tonight, probably around the midnight hour and then start its turn paralleling the Texas coastline thereafter and over the next couple of days. We'll talk more about this, take a look at how much rain has fallen and talk about rain chances beyond right now. Coming right up, Steve. Thank you, Adam. We're still working to identify a man who was found dead in his Halotus home last night. This happening in the 14,600 block 
of Marin Hollow Drive. The Holotus Police Department says they are waiting on the medical examiner to determine the cause of death. It's very much a mystery right now. We're going to continue following this story. We'll provide updates as new information comes in. We're also working to learn the name of a 43 year old Bear County inmate who was found dead in his cell. Here's what we know right now. The inmate was in jail on a criminal trespassing charge. He was found by a deputy this morning. Medical staff unable to save his life, though. He may have died after experiencing some sort of a medical episode due to a pre existing condition. It is shaping up to be a supreme showdown. President Trump says he will nominate his pick to replace late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg by the end of the week. This as Democrats try to use the court vacancy to help Joe Biden's campaign. Camila Bernal explains how the political battle may impact the presidential election as well as the highest court in the land. As the nation mourns the death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, President Trump is moving fast to nominate her replacement. I will mm -hmm. announce it either Friday or Saturday. The late jurist and equal rights icon will lie in repose at the Supreme Court on Wednesday and Thursday. We should wait till the services are over mm -hmm. for Justice Ginsburg and then the work begins. The president promising to fill her seat with a woman. A very talented, very brilliant woman. But who he nominates could amount to the biggest decision of the Trump presidency. There are actually five I'm looking at. It's down to five. President Trump is attempting to shift the ideological balance of the court and create a decisive 6 to 3 conservative majority. A conservative court is also a priority for Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who vows to give the president's nominee a vote. That I will but not Democrats are mobilizing against a court appointment this close to an election. To try and decide this at this last time, at this late moment, is despicable and wrong and against democracy. The Senate showdown extending to the campaign trail as the vacancy adds a new dimension into what's already becoming a contentious election. Even if President Trump wants to put forward a name now, the Senate should not act until after the American people select their next president. At stake, a generational shift in the makeup of the highest court in the land that could decide cases impacting health care, civil rights, and even the outcome of the presidential election. In Washington, I'm Camila Bernal reporting. A vibrant by mail process. Bear County Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan providing an update on what she's anticipating for the November 3rd general election in Bear County. As of today, more than 1,162,000 voters are registered in Bear County. By comparison, we just had over 1,049,000 registered voters at this time in the last presidential election. The next big step, Kellanen says, is sending out more than 73,000 mail-in ballots, which will begin on Friday. Don't forget, the deadline to register to vote is October 5th. Bear County Commissioner's Court will have a new look in the new year. Precinct 3 Commissioner Kevin Wolf is not seeking re-election, and a woman will be filling his seat. And one woman hoping to join the court is Democrat Christine Hortek, who hopes voters will make her the first Democrat to hold that seat in more than 50 years. When I approach this race, I'm kind of looking at it from, um, even though obviously, even though it's a campaign, um, not really a partisan politics type of position. Christine Hortick says running for office was never a lifelong dream, but in her role as president of the Children's Court Attorney Association, she's kept up on what the court does. Over the years, I started watching um, the court and following along and, you know, really, um, saw how uh, much influence the court had over the county and and the decisions they made and so um, you know i thought about it for a couple years actually about whether i would um, uh, ever decide to run for it hortex says while transportation and helping small business during a pandemic are issues the biggest issue she hears precinct three residents talking about is property taxes i tell them you know you need to reach out to your legislature um, your representatives and really pay attention as to who you're electing to those positions because local officials we're going to have to work with them if we're going to make any sort of long-term um plan to address that uh, that problem. Hortick says whether it's her or her opponent, having a woman on the court 
will also provide an important perspective. Women represent more than half of the population in Bear County. And so I think, um, you know, we have our own perspective uh, on things. And I think that whoever um, the women are on the court, that they need to be strong and represent their, their precinct well and, you know, work, work to the best of their abilities to work with the other members of Commissioner's Court. Hortick will face Republican Trish DeBerry in the race to replace Kevin Wolf. We'll hear from DeBerry coming up at 6 p.m. Both candidates will be taking part in a community forum I'm going to be moderating tomorrow night. It's a partnership with the group Northside Neighborhoods for Organized Development, and we want you to ask questions. We have a place to submit questions right now on KSAT.com. That forum will begin tomorrow online at 7.30. And families with babies in the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit, already know the stress of isolation. But the pandemic has made it even harder on preemie parents. Right now, during NICU Awareness Month, Courtney Friedman introduces us to a strong mother and daughter and gives us a rundown of current hospital protocols. Miss Alizé. <laughs> Little Alize has a right to be sleepy. She's been fighting hard since the day she was born. February 9th at 24 weeks, weighing one pound, nine ounces. You're already done with the stress of the NICU life. Now all of a sudden you have the pandemic happen and it's just like, it's a double whammy. It's like, oh my gosh. Mom Jenna Bolick says the pandemic hit about a month into Alize's 97 day stay in the Baptist Hospital NICU. At the time, only one caregiver was allowed to visit at a time. Now Baptist is allowing two identified and consistent caregivers to visit together, as does Methodist. But University and Christus are still only allowing one parent to visit the NICU at a time. All local hospitals we contacted said visitors are screened before entering the hospital and NICU and masks are worn at all times. Her fight and her strength makes you feel like nothing else in this world. I mean, that she can do it. Bolig wants parents going through it right now to know you can do this. Have your faith in these doctors. Have your faith in these nurses. Bolig is a medical assistant at an OBGYN office and calls her colleagues heroes who continue to risk their own health to save the tiniest of lives. You will smile there. Say thank you. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Alizé is one cute little fighter. Hospitals like University are using technology to help enhance parent communication with babies that are in the NICU. They've expanded their Angel Eye program, allowing parents to see their babies remotely through a camera. It is an issue that affects us all. This week on our weekly digital program, Case Hat Explains, we're continuing the conversation about transportation in San Antonio. A huge part of that conversation centers around mass transit. The importance of transit to those without cars or any other way to get around is obvious. But those who've studied the issue say even if you don't use public transportation, you likely rely on someone who does. 60% of the riders during the very beginning of the pandemic were going to work. Where were they going? Everything was shut down. And it's like, clearly they were going to places that were essential, right? The places that we got our groceries from or we were taking out to go orders from, right? The places where we, hospitals, the places where we deemed essential. KSAT explains transportation in San Antonio part two will be available to stream on demand this Thursday. You can watch it on the KSAT TV app on Roku, Fire Stick, or most other smart television devices. If you use a trash, a rather cash app to transfer and receive funds or ever run into a problem, you need to proceed with caution. A simple Google search put one user in touch with a scammer. Up next, what he convinced her to do that left her bank account strapped for cash. Scam alert, payment apps like Zelle, Venmo, and Cash App are very popular, especially during these contact-free times. But user beware, there's a scam circulating that can siphon your bank account within seconds. 12 Under Sides, Marilyn Moore, it's with a story of a woman who had used all of these major apps with no problem, that is until she needed to contact the Cash App. 
It was a Saturday. I was with my kids. I was with my mom. Like a lot of us, Sakayla Lewis is busy, so when she couldn't find a phone number for Cash App on the app, she Googled it and dialed. The man who answered seemed helpful. He was very understanding. He said, you know, we'll take care of this. Just give us a moment. Um, we just need to do a test verification. That test required her to download the Team Viewer app so he could, quote, verify her account was legit. A few seconds into the test, Lewis started getting notifications of money transfers. I saw notifications for 250 for 999 for 2000 for 500 So I went to my bank account, um, and he was saying, ma'am, you need to stay on Cash App. Please go back to Cash App. Don't leave Cash App. What happened? Team Viewer is an app that lets others control your device remotely. The man on the phone wasn't with Cash App at all. But in fewer than five minutes, he'd nearly drained Lewis's bank account. I'm screaming. I'm yelling. I'm upset. And he's calm and he's saying, you know, we're, we're going to figure it out. I asked to speak to a manager. She gets on the phone and she does the exact same thing. In all, a near $5,800 loss. Lewis deleted the app and called her bank to dispute the transactions. Cash App says it's aware of the scheme and you should only contact them through its app or website. The good news is Lewis was able to get all of her money back by disputing the transactions with her bank. These payment apps are convenient, but beware fake customer service numbers planted on the Internet. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. All right, we have some areas of rain to talk about and, of course, the latest on Tropical Storm Beta. A very low end storm right now, but nonetheless, uh, rising the water levels a little bit along the Texas coast, as we saw with Justin earlier, and especially causing some rainfall along the Texas coast. So let's talk about all of this right now. Looking at the rainfall estimates so far today, you see the bulk of the moisture fell just south of Houston thus far, but we still have more time to really tally up those totals here along the Texas coast because this is such a slow moving system. As for closer to home here, mainly central and then eastern Bear County has seen the shower so far with upwards of about four tenths of an inch estimated in parts of the county. You get closer to Floresville. And we've had some heavier downpours there nearly an inch just southeast of Floresville. So here's the big picture in terms of where it's raining right now. The heaviest action closer to the center of circulation, which is just offshore. But we have we have some showers southern Atascosa County basically Poteet southward towards Charlotte and just moved through Pleasanton here in town. We've got this little elongated batch, which does drop some decent rainfall with it. It's just slowly working its way westward and I mean at about five, six miles per hour, making that progress westward. So Lacoste, you should get this around 622 PM. It's going to take some time to actually make it there and at Escosa, you're not that far away, probably within 10 minutes or so you'll be seeing it, but this is I-35 and 410, some moderate rain in that area. You go up to the west side of town, Enrique Barrera Parkway here, West Commerce, and we still have some moderate to heavy rain even along 151. So definitely causing some wet roads out there, but a good little soaker here for the lawns and gardens. All right, big picture. You see some of these bands that have been working their way westward throughout the day today. The heaviest rain closer to Houston and the rain actually spreads all the way toward New Orleans from this system. It's just very intermittent in nature. It's not a fully contained shield of rain that's constant. It's coming and going and I think we'll still have some showers periodically coming and going tonight, but I'm not expecting all that much in terms of accumulations. This system not very strong now. It's a max sustained winds at about 45 miles per hour, which are still offshore and it's just crawling to the northwest later on tonight after midnight, likely to be onshore and then it's going to make its turn and basically move right along the coastline late tonight through the day tomorrow and then get quickly pushed on out of Texas as we get into Thursday. Our rain chance is not that great from here on out, so enjoy this batch while we have it. Uh, some scattered activity tonight, then tomorrow for the first part of the day, about a 30% chance, so isolated in nature. At the airport so far, about a quarter of an inch, 0.23, but look at that high temperature of 75. Right now we're at 69 degrees, that's it, in San Antonio. Meanwhile, you go to Hondo, it's 81, Uvalde 82 along with Carrizo Springs. That, of course, is all sunshine dependent where we have the clouds and we've had some rain. 
We're right near 70 degrees and as we go through the evening, we'll have a few passing showers through sunset, then just cloudy and some isolated to widely separated showers possible tonight through sunrise tomorrow. And then we could even squeeze in a few breaks in the clouds, making it to near 80 degrees the high on your Tuesday, Wednesday, back to some sunshine mid 80s and then it looks like low 90s and sunny by the weekend. But you can see our rain chances really falling off after this. Looks pretty nice for the rest of the week. Thanks, Adam. All right, I guess we can call them the cardiac cowboys. Oh, again, yes, we can. Yeah. Can you imagine if you shut that game off out of frustration yeah. and then Some either people probably did. saw the score or tuned back in and they won? Yeah. yeah, this is the most improbable victory I've seen in a long time coming from the Dallas Cowboys. And it's all on one particular moment that changed the course of the entire game. And the Texans' tumble continues. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys defied all odds when they were able to come back against the Atlanta Falcons to win their home opener despite three turnovers and three poor coaching decisions. How bad did Dallas defy the odds up until Sunday? Any team since 1933 who had scored 39 points with zero turnovers never lost 440 times to none. The Cowboys are their own worst enemy to start with. Ezekiel Elliott fumbling twice, Dak Prescott once, calling two fake punts and a two point conversion that fails. Still, Prescott was able to lead his team back by scoring three rushing touchdowns in the second half and also a 10-yard toss to Dalton Schultz to get the Cowboys within two with 1.49 to play. Then the improbable Greg Zerline's onside squib kick was left untouched by the Falcons special teams, allowing the Cowboys to recover once he went past 10 yards. And now Dallas has a shot to win the game. Prescott, who threw for 450 yards, finds rookie wide receiver C.D. Lamb, who scored his first 100-yard game as a professional to get down to the 30. And then with no time left, Zerline boots the game-winning 46-yard field goal, and the comeback is complete. Dallas wins it 40-39, to nothing short of incredible. I think after that third turnover, we got together and we're like, man, look, they're not stopping us. We, we're only stopping ourselves. We're giving them the ball. And uh, if we take care of the ball, we're going to have a shot to go win that thing. And, um, you know, we did a we took care of the ball and we went out there and scored. And uh, defense made the stops that they made and um, they needed to make. And uh, we, we ended up getting it up. We're blessed to get a victory. Uh, we know we needed it. Um, and, and, and now we're one and one. We're, we're at 500. And, we got to keep this thing going. Doesn't get any easier for Dallas. Next up, the Seahawks in Seattle at 3.25 p.m. Meantime, the Houston Texans lost their home opener in front of an empty NRG stadium to the Baltimore Ravens to drop to 0-2 and, and start their 2020 season. Like the Cowboys, the Texans were their own worst enemy to start with after Deshaun Watson hit Kiki QT, but the ball was knocked out, recovered by LJ Fort, returned to 22 yards for a Baltimore touchdown to put the Ravens up 20 to 7. But the biggest problem for the Texans, their run defense. They gave up 230 yards on the ground, 30 of them off this direct snap to Mark Ingram, who cruised to a 30 yard touchdown in the 33 to 16 loss. They're a potent offense and they have a lot of capabilities, so you give them credit as well. I mean, they're, they're a very good offense. And, and when you have a quarterback that can run the way he can run, um, he's going to make plays. Um, so it's a matter of slowing him down. But um, I have to go back and watch the film to see exactly what it was, whether it was scheme, whether it was tackling, what it may be. Um, but whatever it is, we got to get corrected, obviously. Next up, the Texans travel to Pittsburgh Sunday at noon where the Steelers are 2-0. And, oh. and speaking of 2-0, and oh, so are the UTSA Roadrunners on yeah. national TV coming up at 6. Thank you, Greg. Got it. We'll be right back.